Hello. For this Black History Month 2023 video, we're going to talk about Nella Larson's novel Quicksand. Um, now, Nella Larson is probably my favorite Harlem Renaissance writer and one of my favorite, if not my favorite, American modernist writers. Um, she had a very, very short writing career. She only wrote Quicksand and Passing and then a couple of short stories. Uh, then there was an accusation of plagiarism, which was largely unfounded, is my sense, but uh, it sort of drove Larson out of writing. Um, she did a number of different things over her life, and so in that sense, she's actually quite like Helga Crane, the protagonist of Quicksand, um, because this is a novel in which one of the dominant themes is existential discontent in this sort of rootless searching for meaning. This is very, very modernist for any of you who know uh, the high modernists, um, people like Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, T.S. Eliot, um, these kinds of authors, this idea of like the lack of meaning, the challenge of finding meaning in a world that seems fundamentally meaningless will be very, very familiar. So Helga Crane starts, starts out at this school called Naxos, um, which is a school in Tennessee for African American, it seems like just girls. Um, she initially had been very, very keen on the social uplift mission of this school when she had arrived two years earlier. But by the time we meet her, she's done. She has, she has lost confidence in the project of the school. Um, and part of what seems to be the issue is this element of white paternalism combined with this sort of um, what is it? Uh, Booker T. Washington style like learn, learn to be in your place in American society. This sort of mechanized type of ex, uh, education that Naxos seems to uh, endorse. And so we, we have this contrast, right, between when she had first arrived, when she was idealistic, when she was uh, devoted to, to the mission of the school. And then it says, uh, sitting there in her room long hours after, this is after a white preacher has come and basically been like, yes, you all are learning to stay in your place in American Southern segregated racist society. And that's a good thing. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so the, the novel says, sitting there in her room long hours after, Helga again felt a surge of hot anger and seething resentment. And again, it subsided in amazement at the memory of the considerable applause which had greeted the speaker just before he had asked his God's blessing upon them. The South, Naxos, Negro education. Suddenly she hated them all. Strange, too, for this was the thing that which uh, she had ardently desired to share in, to be a part of this monument to one man's genius and vision. So, she leaves Noxus. She goes back to uh, her birthplace of Chicago. She is not initially able to find work. She's also not necessarily super dedicated to finding work until her financial situation becomes desperate, um, at which point she's finally able after a long uh, struggle of unemployment, she's finally able to find temporary employment organizing the lecture notes of a prominent uh, speaker about racial issues on a trip to New York. Um, on the trip, they become friends. Helga gets uh, Helga decides she wants to stay in New York rather than going back to Chicago and trying to find work there. Um, so this speaker introduces her to a friend um, and gets her a job in New York. Uh, 
Helga lives with that friend for quite a while. It's a very sophisticated, upper-class Harlem lifestyle. Um, fancy parties, nice um, music, getting together and having witty, urbane, sophisticated conversations about racial issues, about literature, about art, about philosophy, whatever it is. Um, and, and Helga is very happy there for a time. Then she starts to get less happy. Um, she becomes sort of discontented with this lifestyle, even though initially when she had gotten to New York, she had thought, all right, this is perfect. I'm this, I can stay here forever. Now she grows discontented. So eventually uh, she gets some money from her white uncle in um, Chicago. While she was in Chicago, she had gone to his house and his new wife had basically been like, yeah, no, you're black, we're white. Peace out. So uh, eventually she gets a substantial amount of money from the 1920s. She gets, she gets $5,000 from her wealthy white uncle. And he's basically like, why don't you go uh, and hang out with my sister in Copenhagen? Since she always... You were there as a kid. You loved it. She always wanted you to come back. And Helga's like, all right, I'm off to Copenhagen. Um, in Copenhagen, she's once again very, very happy. And then, uh, and she's sort of this social curiosity because she's the only person of African descent in the sort of upper class Copenhagen social circle. Um, she has her portrait painted by this like really top notch, like the the portrait painter of Copenhagen society. Um, she's going to all the parties and everything. She's getting all kinds of new clothes and she's like, yeah, this is amazing. I'm gonna stay here forever. Then she starts to get less amazed with it. Um, so once again, we have this pattern, this recurring pattern of going and seeking something out and being happy and thinking that that is what she wants to do for the rest of her life and then becoming disillusioned with it. Um, and so again, this is one of those big, big things that we see with modernist literature, this sort of dissatisfaction, this feeling of not having a place or of not being contented in a place. It is, again, tied to this sort of emergence of existentialism uh, that we get, this uh, emergence of high modernism, um, ennui, and stuff like this. Um, and we get this really, I think, uh, really quite definitely around the latter portion of Helga's stay in Harlem before she goes to Copenhagen. It says, but it didn't last, this happiness of Helga Cranes. Little by little, the signs of spring appeared, but strangely, the enchantment of the season so enthusiastically, so lavishly greeted by the gay dwellers of Harlem, filled her only with restlessness. Somewhere within her, in a deep recess, crouched discontent. She began to lose confidence in the fullness of her life. The glow began to fade from her conception of it. As the days multiplied, her need of something, something vaguely familiar, but which she could not put a name to and hold for definite examination, became almost intolerable. She went through moments of overwhelming anguish. She felt shut in, trapped. Perhaps I'm tired, need a tonic or something, she reflected. So she consulted a physician who, after a long, solemn examination, said that there was nothing wrong, nothing at all. A change of scene, perhaps for a week or so, or a few days away from work, would put her straight, most likely. Helga tried this, tried them both, but it was no good. All interest had gone out of living. Nothing seemed any good. She became a little frightened, and then shocked to discover that, for some unknown reason, it was of herself she was afraid. Spring grew into summer, languidly at first, then flauntingly. Without awareness on her part, Helga Crane began to draw away from those contacts which had so delighted her. More and more, she made lonely excur excursions to places outside Harlem. A sense of estrangement and isolation encompassed her. As the days became hotter and the streets more swarming, a kind of repulsion came upon her. She recoiled in aversion from the sight of the grinning faces, 
And from the sound of the easy laughter of all these people who strolled aimlessly now, it seemed up and down the, the avenues. Not only did the crowds of nameless folk on the streets annoy her, she, uh, she began also actually to dislike her friends. So again, for people familiar with high modernism, um, thinking the work of Virginia Woolf, for instance, Mrs. Dalloway with Septimus Smith, uh, or, or Clarissa Dalloway herself, um, thinking the work of T.S. Eliot, something like The Wasteland, this, these themes of alienation, of anxiety, of existential discontent will be very, very familiar. And this is the pattern that runs through quicksand. Um, the final sort of episode of quicksand, Claire, uh, um, Helga comes back to Harlem after having been in Copenhagen and grown discontented with it. Um, she goes to this revival meeting um, and she has this kind of spiritual awakening, awakening that's somehow tied to the fact that she's been drinking excessively, she hasn't eaten, she's been out in this really terrible storm, so she's cold, she's disoriented, etc., etc. And this sort of spiritual experience washes over her, and she comes to God she immediately decides to kind of seduce the minister who has uh, converted her, and she marries him. Um, they move to Alabama, which is where he's from. Um, he is the priest, or he's the, the pastor of this small town congregation. She is the pastor's wife, and so she has this sort of exalted station. But basically, this is the first time in which she is not particularly concerned about social status as such. Um, she is sort of devoting herself to this community and to her ideas of uplift, which are largely aesthetic rather than sort of dealing with the material conditions of poverty and excessive numbers of children in many cases. Um, but she also gets sort of worn down as she has child after child, um, and she simply is not prepared to run a household um, in a way that, that the other women of this community definitely are. So there's that, there's that element of it. Um, and then finally, she ends up getting super, super sick. Basically, she's like on the verge of dying. She, she has postpartum depression, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, after the birth of her fourth child, I think, who, who dies shortly after the birth. Um, and she basically has this period where she's like blissfully she, she's comfortably numb, if we're gonna if we can borrow a, a phrase from Pink Floyd. Um, she basically is just like she shuts down, she's in bed, nothing going on. Um, eventually, she starts to come around. She decides that she's going to leave this pastor. Um, but then the end of the novel is basically like, by the time she was back on her feet, she was pregnant with her fifth child. So she gets sort of trapped in this, in this world. So there's a couple of things that are, I think are really, really interesting here. Um, the existential dread of high modernism is definitely one of them. But there's also, so the race question in the parlance of the 1920s pervades this novel. Um, she is, she starts out at Naxos, which is a school for African Americans run under the patronage of white people. Uh, and they, they have a white speaker who comes in and is like, yeah, stay in your place. Um, she goes to Chicago. She has trouble finding work, partially because of her race. Uh, she goes to New York and lives in Harlem, and she has this sort of kinship with the African-American residents of that neighborhood. Then she becomes discontented with the continual sort of talk about the race problem among her social circle. 
and with seeing African Americans all the time. So she goes to Copenhagen, where she is the only person of African descent, and that gets to be her, like, party piece, basically. Like, she gets to go to parties, and everybody's like, ooh, you're black-skinned. We've never seen this before. So interesting, whatever it is. Um, and then she gets discontented with that, um, and then she goes and she's like, oh, I found this simple country life of deep religious faith and physical and mental suffering. That's the real, true experience. And then she's like, actually, this kind of sucks. So, interestingly enough, she goes through this whole, like, scope of African-American experiences. This, again, Booker T. Washington-style um, industrial education model, um, which was very, very prominent because Washington's theories were very, very prominent. Um, urban poverty, life in Harlem, jazz clubs, all this, uh, all this stuff of this sort of Harlem Renaissance period. Um, expatriation. Someone like James Baldwin, for instance, was a very, very prominent African-American expatriate who lived in Europe to get away from some of the racism in the U.S. And then the sort of return to the agrarian South and the, the spiritualism of, sort of the Black Baptist community and things like this. So she goes through this whole range of experiences really kind of running the gamut of typical African-American experiences in, in the 1920s. Um, and, and in a way that's actually reflected in, um, in Larson's own experiences, because she did a number of different jobs. She was a nurse, she was a librarian, she was a writer, she was a teacher. She did all these different jobs in these different places, and she kind of had this, this broad set of experiences. So she was, I, I think Larson sort of brought a lot of her own experience, a lot of her own anxieties to this character of Helga Crane and used it to explore these sort of intersections between the African-American experience and the modernist experience of alienation and discontent. 